Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and it's another edition of The Blues Fix here on MisplacedStraws.com. And my guest today and his band, The Cold Stairs, have just released a new record called Voices, and it's surely going to end up on a lot of year-end best lists across all genres. Their riff-laden brand of the blues incorporates everything from traditional front porch blues to modern blues rock, all drenched in a layer of fuzz. Please welcome from the cold stairs, Chris Tapp. Welcome. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And now you and drummer Brian Mullins, you guys have played together as a duo for quite a while now, but you've recently added a bass player to the mix. What led to the decision to expand the band? Um, I just kind of felt like as a duo, we'd kind of run its course as far as creatively. You know, we it was a good thing early on because it kind of, put some parameters on the songwriting, you know, if we wanted to pull it off live, but we had done a European tour in 21 and came back um, from that and had some conversations with our record label and just some other people. And, um, you know, we weren't, I wasn't able to play the guitar solos live. We were mm. kind of working around that and doing, doing some stuff. Um, but we just kind of felt like it was time. And I wanted to add going into the voices record. I wanted to add a bass player, to be able to write, you know, to write as a three piece instead of a two piece. So, well, so and the sonic change on voices compared to your other records is pretty dramatic. You, naturally, there's that thicker, fuller sound. When it came to writing, was there a challenge for you now adding in a bass player to write for and to just keep in mind when you're writing your guitar parts? Um, not so much a challenge, but more like uh, more options on the buffet, trying to decide what to take and what not to. You know, we um, before I was still playing bass parts in the studio. You know, I was just trying to stay pretty close to the guitar. A lot of times, if if I you know if I didn't track it with the guitar, if I tracked it with the bass. But uh, with this record, you know, I, I I didn't really write any of Bryce's parts. I just came up with the stuff and said, Hey, what do you think fits here? And nine times out of 10, you know, he nailed it, but we wanted the bass to be able to move fluidly without being attached to the guitar, which it always had been before. And the record itself, it feels like the most diverse record you guys have ever done. And I love that it makes this really great journey from, you know, the gritty heaviness of nothing but the blues to, you know, the gorgeous ballad with sorry, I was late you know, the Sunhouse revival of Throw That Stone. It's a diversity that I don't think I heard in your previous records. What kind of led you to say, okay, now we've done that. Now I want to do something just more expansive and different. Right. Um, you know, we had done that to a certain extent with doing some acoustic stuff before, but never and never, especially in the in the electric realm, kind of pushed ourselves to play, you know, outside where we normally would. I just felt like it was time, you know, there's some statements that I wanted to make and some things I wanted to do. And having Bryce on the bass, you know, allowed us to be able to do that and play some things we hadn't played before um, and just kind of mix it up. A lot of the records that I really love. Led Zeppelin three, a lot of a lot of stuff from the seventies, you know, really has a broad palette of mm -hmm. of some different textures and stuff. And I always like that. There's there's a few bands, A C D C the Cult. There's a couple bands that kind of you can go from track one to track ten and it all is similar and but still works. Um and I kind of felt like Heavy Shoes was more like a record like that for us. Mm -hmm. This record I wanted to kind of push push out and see what we can do. Um and a lot of that was just kind of testing the waters to see what what worked and what didn't. Yeah. And I love that your music sort of takes the base that was created in the past by people like Sun House and Blind Willie Johnson and even Johnny Cash. And then you add in later influences, you know, like Johnny Winter and Joe Bonamassa, but you create something that's entirely new and unique. What was your musical journey? How, you know, what brought you to where you are now? Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, whenever I was a little kid, I, I was, I started playing piano whenever I was four. I was writing songs at like six or seven. And basically I would just take songs that were on the radio and, and rewrite the words to them, you know, and, and I don't know why that I did that, but it was a great 
uh, learning structure to, to understand songs and, and understand, okay, we're at the bridge, we're at the chorus or why he's repeating that line, you know, that must be the thing he's trying to get across or she's trying to get across. Um, you know, we're kid we're kids of the nineties and the grunge stuff was really popular when we were, you know, when we were coming up and, um, I, I guess I'm always been a little bit of a historian about, you know, why does it, why is this like this? Or where did this come from? Um, and also we were all fortunate or Brian and I were fortunate. Um, Bryce listened to his older, older brother's catalog. Brian and I both had friends when we were growing up that were a decade older than us that were listening to their older brothers, mm -hmm. Zeppelin albums or cream records. And, you know, um, so it was a pretty easy, um, you know, it was a short crawl to get back to, kind of the originators of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that super interesting. And then I think once you do that, then it's kind of like a chef, you know, if you got more ingredients in there to pull from, I d I'm not a fan of bands that do the exact same thing of somebody that they emulate. You know, I love Clapton, but I don't want to make, I don't want to do something that sounds just like cocaine. Um, so for us, it's, Hey, this kind of works with this. I, I always felt like the, story songwriting of the early blues artists and guys like Dylan and cash would really fit well in the realm of rock and blues stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it already had been in there in some stuff, but to even push it even further and just make sure when we're writing a song that it lyrically also speaks, mm -hmm. you know, and has a statement. Black Sabbath is a, is a great example of that. You look at songs like war pigs or, you know, some of those songs, they really lyrically, if you read them, they, they're making a statement lyrically as well as having a cool music part so but you know speak about songwriting i mentioned the track sorry i was late and it's a song that just blows me away and i've talked about this with some of my favorite songwriters i've gotten to interview over the years that i think there are two types of writers there's the ones that write kind of a vague song about a general topic and they hope that we as the listener can find ourselves in it and then there are ones, and I think Beth Hart is a great example of this, and you as well, where you write about something that's so specific, that's your own personal experience, but because it's so well written, you're allowing us to find ourselves in your experience. And I think when that happens, there's just nothing better than that. Um, do you ever struggle at all with how much of yourself to put into a song or does the lyric just kind of come out? Um, the lyric always comes out. It's it's the filter of do I allow, do I want to go here or not? You know, a lot of the songs in um, in early catalog and stuff that I've written has been, um, you know, it could be a song like Break My Fall off of um, Headband. That's a song about a guy that gets hung for something that he didn't do. And obviously I haven't man, I'm, yeah. I've never been to the gallows, but that sentiment of, mm -hmm. you know, I've gone through a divorce around that time, the sentiment of getting accused of something that you didn't do, you know? So sometimes I'm writing uh, a playwright in which the, the narrative fits something that's going on in my life, but is not super autobiographical as far as mm -hmm. um, being able to read it exactly on this new record. There were a couple things that I just wrote just straight from the heart in it. Sorry, I was late was one of those that I didn't, I didn't write that for the record. I had got a keyboard in, I was working on some organ stuff and I got a keyboard in and I sat down and that was kind of the first thing I played in. I just started writing lyrics as a song about my granddad uh, who passed away, committed suicide whenever I was young. And I, I was the one that had found him and got the call to, to check on him. And um, you know, it, I'm sure that that tragedy probably had, found its way in some other songs uh, kind of submersively. Um, but this, I just wrote, it just came out. I probably wrote the thing in three minutes. The problem with finishing was trying to sing the damn thing uh, without, you know, getting upset. And that the vocal took me about three weeks to be able to get through it. But, um, you know, that one, when I got done with it, I was like, well, you know, this record, we really want to do some things we haven't done before. I haven't done a keyboard song. And I, I just feel like if I put this out in it, helps one other person that's dealt with something similarly, you know, or even a loss of whatever, you know, that, that, that helps, then that's a, 
I think it's good karma. You know, it's a good thing. I didn't want to be selfish and go, okay, well, this makes me feel a little bit better about the situation, but I can't share it. You know, you don't want to share something that will hurt somebody. You do want to share something if it helps somebody. That's good for the whole world, I feel like. So definitely. And I think the first time that I ever heard your band, um, you had a song in the show Animal Kingdom, which is one of my favorite shows. Um, the song was Sleeping with Lions. And that song had popped up in a few other things around that time as well. Um, you also had a song pop up in a Dodge commercial. The music business has changed so much over the past few decades. I mean, at, at that time, you guys are an unsigned band, an, an independent band. How big is it for you to get those song placements, whereas in the past, you know, radio would have that job? All right. Yeah, it's changed a lot. I mean, radio helps. Now with satellite radio, XM radio, the the blues channel, you know, plays our stuff and that helps Definitely. a little bit. Yeah. But mm -hmm. We had a, this last fall, we had a Chevy truck commercial um, that ran all through the football season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I kept getting messages. I'd posted it on our social media, but I kept getting messages still that would say, hey, man, somebody, some band ripped off your sound, you know, and <laughs> there's a band that sounds just like you in the Chevy commercial. I'm like, dude, I posted that, you know, three times. You haven't seen it. That's us. Those things help exponentially. Um, th they give validation to the band to say, you know, you know, that's like our the, the cyberpunk uh, video game that those 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 things give validation to say, okay, you're writing at a level that professionals feel like that this will help sell their product or whatever else. Um, it definitely helps financially because, you know, as you know, streaming is just, it's, you can't make a living uh, off of people listening to your music anymore. Um, touring helps, but also, as you know, as the last few years, touring can get crushed in a moment. And even though we're back touring now, venues are very uh, afraid to to invest much in the show with afraid of losing things. They they can't hire people. People are not coming in the bars and the, and the venues and theaters to work. So it's tough. Um, so we're always, you know, trying to get those yeah, things. We've had a few of those that we've passed on that I felt like the money was great, but I don't want to sell crackers or mayonnaise or, you know. So it has to fit. Animal Kingdom was a great fit. The video mm -hmm. game was a great fit. Chevy and Dodge, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. work for Bob Seger. I can't, I'm not going <laughs> to argue it too much. So, But it it, it, it definitely helps. Um, and it will definitely pay off a record. Uh, with Mascot, the record label we're with now, we haven't had one of those syncs. Mm -hmm. With the other deals that we had, we all had a sync, and the sync would immediately pay for the record, you know, mm -hmm. so. You know, we're trying to climb out of that hole of, of investing all the money in the record and still yeah. tough. Yeah. And, you know, let's switch a bit to playing live. Um, You guys have an extensive European tour coming up. Has there been an adjustment being on the stage with a third person there? I mean, does it allow you to do some songs in the past that maybe you didn't do before, but now you can? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And the ability to play the solos and the extra parts that I had on the record that I wasn't able to before and just enjoying playing guitar, man. It, you know, before I was playing two guitar amps and a bass amp simultaneously, you know, to cover, to, to make it thick. And now I can not play if I want to I can sit out for a measure. I can you know play a chord instead of a single note. So it's as a guitar player, it's been extremely creative and forced me to, to work hard, but also really enjoy it, you know. And will you guys be hitting the States at all after this European run? Yeah, we've got some shows, uh, some short run shows in the States between now and May. Then we're in Europe, basically May to August 1st. And then I think we're going to, we're working on a run through Texas, working on a run down through Florida, and then something maybe in the Northeast between August and uh, January. So well i'm up in new england so hopefully we'll get you up here in the northeast sometime soon i'd love to hear these songs live yeah yeah we'd love to be up there so we've been spending some time here with chris tapp his band is the cold stairs the record is called voices it's out everywhere it's fantastic i i love the record i've been listening to it quite a bit lately chris thanks for taking the time to do this best of luck with the record and hopefully we can catch you on the road sometime soon Sounds good, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks.